Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. I'll tell you more about them later. Oh, when you think of ancient civilizations, there are a few that probably come to mind. The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, and the Mayans are the most well-known ancient peoples. These are the ones that history books tend to focus on in varying degrees, largely because they're the ones who left behind the most for us to study. But ancient civilizations existed for a long time all over the world, and there are entire civilizations that often go overlooked. Today, uh, we're going to look at some of these other ancient civilizations, that you've probably never heard of. The Nok civilization, usually referred to as Nok culture, was one of the earliest known societies in Western Africa. Unfortunately, they did not have a written language, so knowledge about their society is very limited. In fact, we didn't even know they existed until the 20th century. In 1928, Colonel Dent Young, the co-owner of a mining company, was mining for tin near the village of Nok in modern-day Nigeria. It was there, buried 7 meters or 24 feet underground, that the first artifacts from the Nok culture were found in the form of some terracotta statues. The area remained quiet for another 15 years until 1943 when tin miners again accidentally unearthed terracotta figurines. A clerk who was overseeing the mine took home the head of one of these sculptures to use as a scarecrow in his yam field. The scarecrow stood for about a year until it was noticed by Bernard Fagg, a British archaeologist and museum curator who was working extensively in Nigeria at the time. When Bernard saw the scarecrow, he immediately noticed how similar it was in style to the previous terracotta pieces that had been discovered by Young. He traveled to the mining site where he was shown more pieces of art that they had unearthed. It became immediately clear to Bernard that the mining was accidentally both discovering and destroying these priceless archaeological artifacts, but it would take nearly 20 years for proper archaeological excavations to begin. Look, like, it's 2023 and it's more important than ever to keep your online activity safe and private, and that's why today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Picture this. You're out in public, trying to get some work done, or just browsing the web. You log on to the free Wi-Fi. You're like, this looks safe and fine. Well, it's not. Did you know that anyone else on that same network can potentially access your personal information? It's true, and it's terrifying. But there's good news. That's where Surfshark comes in. With their military-grade encryption, all of your data is sort of blurred out so that no one can see what you're doing or where you are. It keeps you're safe. And not only that, but Surfshark makes it easy to access content from back home when you're traveling. Think about when you go abroad and you're like, oh, I was really enjoying the Netflix series. And then you get somewhere and they're like, it's not available in the country you're in. And you're like, that's a bit rubbish, isn't it? Well, with Surfshark, just jump back over to your home country and you'll be fine. Or maybe you're like, well, that country's got a show I want to watch and I can't access it. Well, you can with Surfshark because it allows you to virtually travel around the world with just a tap of the finger. And the best part, you can protect all of your internet activity and enjoy all of the perks of a VPN without breaking the bank. With Surfshark's one subscription unlimited devices policy, you can share one account with all your friends for less than the price of a piece of gum. So, whether you're traveling, online shopping, or just wanting to keep your personal data safe, Surfshark has you covered. Plus, with their add-on security combo, Surfshark Alert, Antivirus, and Search, you can monitor your personal data, keep your device virus-free, and hide from search engines. I personally have been using Surfshark for ages now. It's ridiculously easy to use. You just download it, you select a server, and voila, you are done. So if you want to stay private and protected while online, try out Surfshark VPN today. Go to surfshark.deals forward slash side projects or click the link in the description and enter the promo code side projects to get 83% off and three extra months for free. And don't forget, they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So you got nothing to lose. And now back to today's video. Within the first week of preliminary excavations, discoveries of wrought iron and iron slag were made, leading to the classification of the Nok culture as an Iron Age civilization. Archaeologists were able to use the artifacts found to date the Nok culture as having existed from roughly 1500 BC to 500 AD. However, nobody is entirely sure where these people came from. The crops they grew, particularly millet, are indigenous to the Sahel region in Africa, leading many to speculate that the Nok culture began in northern Africa before migrating to modern-day Nigeria in sub-Saharan Africa, though uh, this can't be stated conclusively yet. The terracotta figurines remain the most iconic part of Nok culture, both because of their abundance and their distinctive style. Though fully intact sculptures are exceedingly rare, there are many examples of terracotta heads. The heads are nearly life-size 
size, and are easily identifiable by their triangular eyes and their detailed and elaborate hairstyles. Though the heads are nearly the size of a full-grown adult, the bodies are not. One example, which can be found in the Louvre, shows a full knock terracotta figure with a head nearly the size of the entire rest of the body. These sculptures have been found across an area of 78,000 square kilometers, which is roughly the size of South Carolina. However, analysis of the clay shows that all of it almost certainly came from a single centralized source. This suggests that the Nock culture were all part of one expansive civilization rather than various tribes using a similar art style. In addition to their terracotta arts, the Nock are also known for their use of iron tools. Archaeologists have found over a dozen iron smelting furnaces, and there are numerous examples of iron tools and weapons, as well as intricately crafted iron decorations. They were advanced metal workers, and there is strong evidence that they developed iron metallurgy between 750 and 550 BC, with some evidence even suggesting that it may have been developed before 1000 BC. But what makes the Nock culture's skill with iron so fascinating is that they began phasing out their stone tools for iron ones. Now, that might not sound like a big deal at first. I mean, metal tools are better than stone ones, so of course they would have made the trade. However, that's not what happened throughout the rest of the world. Sure, everybody else abandoned their stone tools as well, but civilizations went from the Stone Age to the Copper Age to the Bronze Age, and then finally to the Iron Age. The jump from using stone tools to iron is almost entirely unprecedented, with nearly the entire world smelting copper for a full millennium before developing iron metallurgy. And then, by around 280, the knock culture was gone. There's evidence of a very sudden and rapid decline in population, but we don't have any idea why that happened. It's possible they may have depleted their resources of either iron or coal, but for now, all we can do is speculate. Long before the Greeks, the Romans, or even the Egyptians, there was the Vinci culture. The Vinci culture occupied an area in southeastern Europe containing all of modern-day Serbia and Kosovo, as well as portions of modern-day Romania, Greece, Bulgaria, and more. They were active from around 5700 BC to 4500 BC, give or take a couple of hundred years on either side. One of the main defining characteristics of the Vinci was their population density. When farming was introduced to the region, it led to the unprecedented growth of settlements. Vinci cities were not not only much larger than any contemporary culture, but they were even larger than the Bronze Age cities that would exist a millennium later. The average population density of a Vinci settlement was 50 to 200 people per hectare, with that number falling to 50 to 100 people per hectare in the latter part of the Vinci culture. Since those numbers almost certainly mean nothing to you, as a comparison, the density of modern-day London is 56 people per hectare, and modern-day New York is 96 people per hectare. Their average population density over 7,000 years ago was higher than we see in most of the largest cities in the world today. In fact, Manila is currently the only city in the world with a population density higher than 200 people per hectare. So, with all of those people packed so tightly together, well, what exactly did they do? Well, for the most part, people would have been tasked with helping to provide food for their society. This included farming, hunting, and foraging, and animal husbandry. Agriculture was particularly focused on high-yield grains that would help sustain such a dense population. The Vinci were the first to introduce wheat, oat, and flax to this region of Europe. They also began keeping animals alive for milk production rather than just slaughtering them for their meat. While the Vinci culture is generally considered to be part of the Stone Age, they possess the world's earliest known examples of copper smelting. However, though some copper tools from the civilization do exist, the majority of the metallurgical skill uh, was dedicated to trinkets rather than to tools. Because the Vinci were a prehistoric civilization, there's only so much we can know about their everyday lives. The Sumerians wouldn't invent written language until over a thousand years after the decline of the Vinci, so there's no record of anybody's comings and goings. That is, unless we examine the Vinci symbols, the most exciting thing left behind by the civilization. The first artifacts containing Vinci symbols were discovered during an archaeological excavation in 1875 in modern-day Romania, with many more being found since. It's believed by some that these symbols are the earliest examples of a form of proto-writing, though this theory does remain hotly contested among experts. The symbols appear on all sorts of clay artifacts, including tablets and pottery, but there is no agreement on what they might mean. 
There are nearly 700 unique symbols, with some arguing that these symbols represent both words and numbers. Others counter that because most artifacts contain very few symbols, it is unlikely that they were meant to convey any meaningful text. About 85% of inscriptions contain only a single symbol, though others can become more lengthy with 50 or more. Unfortunately, there's unlikely to be any way for us to know for sure what these alleged texts mean. Many attempts have been made to discern some sort of meaning from the symbols, but since they aren't arranged in any obvious pattern, researchers can't even tell if they're trying to read the tablets upside down or not. The Koral Soup Civilization, also known as Norte Chico or simply the Koral, was an ancient civilization in the Koral region of modern day Peru. The archaeologists have only been particularly aware of the ancient sites in the area since the 1940s, but it is now the oldest known civilization in the Americas, predating the Olmec by 2,000 years. Precisely how old the civilization is has yet to be determined. There's some indication that people began settling the region as early as 9200 BC, but it is generally agreed that the first large scale city began being built around 3500 BC. What makes the Koral so intriguing is how differently they developed from civilizations in Eurasia. Unfortunately, these differences, while fascinating, severely limit our knowledge of these ancient people. Particularly, it is their complete lack of ceramics and thus artwork that hinders our ability to learn about their daily lives. While ceramics and artwork would have been valuable in that regard, there's still a lot that we could deduce. The Koral civilization flourished along three major rivers in the area. The Fortaleza, the Padvik and the Supe. While it's common, if not expected, for ancient civilizations to have formed along rivers or by freshwater seas, the area is particularly arid. This is obviously less than ideal for early agricultural civilizations, and the rapid development of widespread irrigation was key for their survival. Because the Koral were oh, near the Pacific coast, they were both coastal cities and inland cities. These cities are believed to have been vastly different from one another, with the coastal cities focusing on maritime activities and the inland cities focusing on agriculture. While it is believed that crops like squash, sweet potatoes, beans, and guava were cultivated inland, there is one other crop that they had that was far more important than the rest cotton. It may not have been edible, but cotton was the greatest commodity that the inland cities could provide with their irrigation. In addition to creating textiles for clothing, it would have allowed the inland cities to create a mutual dependency with the coastal cities. Those living in farming communities needed to rely on the coastal fishermen for the bulk of their protein in the form of both fish and shellfish, but the fishermen relied on the cotton produced inland for the production of fishing nets, bags, and various other utilities. But the fishermen provided more than just food. Sure, that was the majority of it, but the inedible parts of their catches could provide utility as well. For example, the corral used vertebrae from blue whales as stools. There is also evidence that the corral may have developed some sort of proto-writing system. The evidence came in the form of quipu, a type of string-based recording device. And look, it would probably take an entire video to properly explain quipu and how it is believed they were used to represent both numerical information and writing, but the easiest way to explain it is a sort of a crude abacus that's made out of string. However, above all else, the corral civilization was known for its densely constructed cities with large monuments, pyramids, and plazas. The largest of their structures was 160 by 150 meters and 18 meters tall. That's 520 by 490 by 59 feet. Though dwarfed by the Pyramid of Giza, which would have been built at around the same time, the Corral buildings were still impressive for the time. By about 1800 BC, the Corral civilization began to decline, though it's believed that their extensive knowledge of irrigation, which was once their greatest asset, led to their eventual downfall. Though the society had successfully thrived, they had also picked a pretty lousy location for it. With much more fertile territory both to the north and the south of Corral, the people eventually just dispersed and took their knowledge of irrigation with them. This would eventually lead to bigger and better things for the people of South America as a whole, but it was the end of the Corral Civilization. The Dongsang culture gets its name from the village of Dongsang, south of Hanoi, where artifacts from the civilization were first discovered in 1920. Though that is where they were first discovered, it was not the cultural center of the Dongsang people. They were actually more centered in the Red River Valley from 1000 BC until the 1st century AD and are the ancestors of the Vietnamese. They were an agricultural society with a focus on cultivating rice, breeding pigs and water buffalo, as well as fishing. However, what the Dongsang are most known for is their incredible 
skill as bronze workers. The Dongsan were the most advanced bronze working culture in the whole of Southeast Asia. It's unclear whether bronze casting first developed in Southeast Asia and spread to China, or if they developed the practice independently of one another, but there is little dispute that the Dongsan were people without equal. Chief among their casting were the bronze drums. These drums had many uses, including rallying troops of battle during feasts and in times of mourning. The artwork cast into the bronze demonstrated an unparalleled talent, featuring scenes from daily life, recreations of battles, wildlife, boats, and sometimes just elaborate geometric patterns. The drums created by the Dong Sun aren't just notable because of their skilled craftsmanship, but because of how numerous they are. To date, hundreds of these bronze drums have been unearthed, and they were by no means small. The average Dong Sun drum was 63 centimeters tall, that's just over two feet, and could weigh up to 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. To cast a drum of that size would have required smelting between one and seven tons of copper ore, but they got much bigger than that as well. To date, the largest known drum is the Moon of Pajang. It's not just the largest Dong Sun drum, it's the largest single cast bronze kettle drum in the entire world. It comes in at just over 1.8 meters or six feet tall and weighs a staggering thousand kilograms. As for what ultimately happened to the Dong Sun people, once again, we're not completely sure. Theories range from drought to invasion from the Chinese to economic decline as other civilizations began to produce bronze more efficiently. While we can't say for certain which factors played the largest largest role in their decline, we can still marvel at the massive bronze drums that they left behind.